In this video, we will discuss the elongation step of the DNA replication in eukaryotes. Specifically, we will see how polymerase alpha, primase, polymerase epsilon, and delta actually perform the elongation step. We'll also cover what polymerase switching is and how it works. This will be part of the elongation dynamics section. Towards the end, we will see how Okazaki fragment maturation is performed. We will discuss all of this and try to contrast it with the prokaryotic replication as well, so you know how the two are different. I would recommend that you watch the trombone model of elongation video in prokaryotes before you watch this video. Moving from replication initiation, the elongation step is strictly speaking part of the S phase. This follows the origin firing where we saw the replosome assembly. Let's sketch one side of the replosome to understand how it all starts and then continues into elongation. I will not draw the other side because it is an identical process on the other side as well. So as we said before, the CMG helicase moves in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction. This is in contrast to the bacterial DNA B helicase which moves in the 5 to 3' prime direction. But more interestingly, the helicase in prokaryotes has a DNA G primase, which makes the RNA primer. If you want details on prokaryotic helicase and primase, I have a separate video that you can check. Links are in the description down below. Now, in contrast, the eukaryotic primase is actually a subunit of a larger DNA polymerase called DNA polymerase alpha. The primase still has the same function. It makes the RNA primer by using DNA as a template. The bigger component of this is the DNA polymerase subunit, which is DNA polymerase alpha and that makes DNA. So this polymerase alpha and primase has a dual function. It makes both RNA and DNA. Now, to understand how it works, we have to take a note that Paul alpha primase is attracted to the single strand DNA binding protein, RPA. The Paul A specifically, as we will see, also likes to bind the A form of DNA. This form is found in the RNA-DNA duplexes. We have seen this in the prokaryotic replication video. First, the Paul alpha gets to the single-stranded DNA. Now we can start visualizing how it all plays out one step at a time. The first productive contact is made by the primase subunit of the polymerase alpha. The primase then synthesizes a short 7 to 15 nucleotides long RNA primer. The rest of the proteins on the CMG helicase remain relatively unchanged when this happens. Soon after this short RNA primer is made, there is an activity switch from the primase subunit to the DNA polymerase alpha subunit. Now the contact occurs between the polymerase alpha and the RNA DNA duplex. The polymerase alpha is a DNA polymerase. So it adds a short 10 to 20 nucleotide DNA stretch at the 3' prime of the existing RNA primer. Now here is the problem with this setup, and why it is important that the RNA and DNA made by the primase and Paul alpha must be kept short. The polymerase alpha actually does not have any exonuclease domain, which means if it makes a mistake in copying the DNA, that error cannot be fixed. The polymerase alpha, as you notice, also does not depend on the clamp, the PCNA. So inherently, polymerase alpha is also slow, and it can't really go that far. Only about 100 or so nucleotides. But more importantly, because you cannot fix the errors, you want the DNA made by the polymerase alpha to be as short as possible. Here comes our first type of switching event. How is it that primase activity can be switched into a DNA polymerase activity? Let's take a closer look. The primase is the first one to make contact and copy the DNA into an RNA, and this is about 7 to 15 nucleotides in length. This process gives you the RNA-DNA hybrid. And as we said before, the polymerase alpha likes these kind of duplexes because they look like the A form of DNA. This now sets up a competition between the primase and the polymerase alpha subunits. Primase wants to continue making RNA, but polymerase wants to take over and make DNA instead. But eventually, the DNA polymerase alpha wins, and it starts making DNA from the free end of the RNA primer. At this point, the polymerase alpha is in contact with the RNA DNA duplex while it makes DNA in its active site. But as the polymerase alpha keeps making DNA, the RNA DNA duplex moves out of the reach of the polymerase alpha.
and now it starts making contact with the DNA-DNA duplex. This occurs when the DNA synthesized by Paul Alpha is around 10 to 20 nucleotides in length. The issue is that double-stranded DNA here is like the B form of the DNA, but polymerase alpha likes A form. So its affinity for the B form DNA is not so great. Therefore, the polymerase alpha cannot continue making DNA for too long. As a result, typically after adding a short DNA stretch, the Paul alpha primase enzyme is released. There is some evidence that RFC, the clamp loader, can also limit the activity of polymerase alpha. Now the clamp loader can load the PCNA clamps onto the 3' end of the DNA primer. This cycle of primase and Paul alpha continues on the lagging strand synthesis throughout the elongation process. So it is not just limited to the initiating replosomes. By the way, the idea of the clamp loader loading the clamp and its affinity towards the DNA is the same as we saw in the prokaryotes replication. You can check that video for more details. Now to the replosome picture, we can introduce the PCNAs, which are loaded at the 3' end of the primer. Now it is important to point out that the RFC also interacts with subunits of both polymerase epsilon and polymerase delta. So you have a bunch of different types of polymerases crowded near the RFC. Oh, and after the primer making step is complete, the CMG helicase and RFC can reacquire a new primase Paul alpha which, as we said, is required again and again for the lagging strand synthesis. So just to formalize all this, RFC binds the 3' end of the primer made by the polymerase alpha and then loads PCNA clamp at that spot. PCNA stands for proliferating cell nuclear antigen. It is responsible for maintaining the fidelity and processivity of the DNA polymerases. This also means that PCNA attracts DNA polymerases when required. Same thing as we saw in the prokaryotes. And this can be either polymerase delta or polymerase epsilon. Okay, now comes another difference between the prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes have only one type of polymerase for both leading and lagging strand synthesis. In eukaryotes, the polymerase epsilon performs the leading strand synthesis and polymerase delta performs the lagging strand synthesis. So that picture will look something like this. Now we have replaced the DNA polymerase alpha successfully with a DNA polymerase epsilon on the leading strand and DNA polymerase delta on the lagging strand. And this handoff between the two types of polymerases, the non-processive DNA Paul alpha and the processive polymerase delta and epsilon is called polymerase switching. This handoff is performed by the RFC. Now why is it that polymerase delta binds the lagging strand and epsilon binds the leading strand? This question is still unanswered. Researchers think that this is probably a result of how the single-stranded DNA is structured near the RFC, but that is all speculative. Actually, sometimes even polymerase epsilon can be recruited for lagging strand synthesis, and then polymerase delta can sometimes take over later. Anyways, after this ideal polymerase switching is done, the CMG helicase and RFC can reacquire new polymerases. And the CMG helicase keeps moving ahead while all this is happening. Okay, time for another difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, the replosome was a giant complex, physically connected by the tau proteins of the clamp loader. In eukaryotes, the replosome is not physically connected. There are no ponytails in the RFC to tether the lagging and leading strand polymerases with the moving helicase. So what I mean to say is that unlike prokaryotes, the lagging strand synthesis in eukaryotes is disconnected from the rest of the replosome. This leads to the point that the trombone model of elongation does not apply to eukaryotic replosomes. But the general principle of lagging strand synthesis stays the same. So following the synthesis from the replication fork, you get short sequences of DNA as the lagging strand, and one long sequence on the leading strand. The short stretches of DNA are about 200 nucleotides in length. Contrast this to prokaryotes. These Okazaki fragments are about 1000 to 2000 nucleotides in length. So eukaryotic Okazaki fragments are 10 times shorter. By the way, the DNA synthesis mechanism involving the metal catalysis reaction is the same as in bacteria, because many of the important domains in the DNA polymerase are conserved. I have a video link down in the description if you're interested in learning more about it. 
Let's talk about Okazaki fragment maturation before we end this video. In prokaryotes, both leading and lagging strands were made by DNA polymerase 3, and DNA polymerase 1 then came in to perform the Okazaki fragment maturation. In case of eukaryotes, the lagging strand is synthesized by polymerase delta, and polymerase delta also performs the final Okazaki fragment maturation. A new polymerase is not needed. Now let's quickly go over this process. I will focus on the junction of the two Okazaki fragments, A and B, when PCNA and polymerase delta arrive. The polymerase delta keeps moving on and synthesizes DNA while it displaces the strand containing RNA-DNA primer in the front. Now, it is important to point out that PCNA binds a bunch of different proteins, like FEN1 endonuclease, which we saw in prokaryotes as well, and DNA2, which is another kind of nuclease needed if the flaps get too long. These two proteins help cleave this overhang or flap. In the eukaryotes, FEN1 is an independent enzyme. In prokaryotes, it was part of the DNA polymerase 1 complex. After this step, the polymerase delta may be released, and ligase, which is another enzyme bound to the PCNA, finally ligates the two DNA ends. The overall principle of this maturation is the same as we saw in prokaryotes. You should check it out if you need more details. So finally, this converts the discontinuous daughter lagging strand to a continuous DNA strand. And that is all for elongation. In the next video, we will see how DNA replication is terminated.